I'm going to check if it's working. Well, I think we are online. Well, uh, thank you to all of you for being here with us again in this series of virtual dialogues that the Latin American Center at the University of Arizona coordinates with Asuntos del Sur. Also, I want to thank the Confluence Center for Creative Inquiry for the financial support to make this happen. Uh, the topic today is a major topic in not only for international finance but also for the global relation between the North and the South, between the developing and the developed countries. Uh, as you know, Argentina has had a long and is still having a very controversial um, dispute with the so-called butcher funds on the restructuring of its foreign debt that has spurred the international debate on foreign debt. Uh, what we've seen and what the professor Marichal has told us when we talk about foreign debt of one Latin American country, we actually are talking about the whole region. The region has a long standing history of foreign debt and also restructuring of debt that started with the very independence of countries in the 1880s. Uh, what is very interesting to note is that still we haven't been able to establish a multilateral regime to restructure foreign debts. Uh, the good news is this is happening, the international agenda is paying attention to it, and many forums like the United Nations OAS are discussing this. Um, I'm very pleased to have three distinguished experts that will be sharing their thoughts on this matter with us. We are having here in Tucson with us uh, Mr. Eric Lecomte, who is the executive director of the Jubilee USA Network, who has an extensive experience working on foreign debt for develop, developing countries and especially the poorest countries in the world, and has just had uh, very good news this week that they managed to write the uh, uh, for. For Bay, how would how would you say it? The what you got in the African country with Ebola? The, the Ebola stricken country, the most the, poorest okay. countries that have been stricken with the Ebola crisis. Exactly, um, they've been partnered for a uh, hundred million dollars of their foreign debt. Uh, we also have Juan Pablo Bohovlavsky, who is a United Nations independent expert on the effects of foreign debt of the state of for their full employment of human rights. And we also have Gaston Chilier, who is the executive director of the Centro de Estudios Legales y Sociales, uh, an Argentine think tank uh, focused on human rights and is, I think, is the largest in Latin America on the matter. So I think we, we have a great panel, and we're going to start here with Eric. for hosting this event and inviting me to speak. Um, it's also a real honor uh, to be on this panel with my good friend Juan Pablo uh, Bohlavaski, uh, who is one of the foremost experts in the world uh, on these issues, uh, as well as to present with Gaston Schiller uh, today. My comments are entitled, After Argentina and NML Capital, 
Global Consequences from Argentina's Legal Battle with Predatory Hedge Funds. Uh, before I jump into the topic, let me share with you uh, who Jubilee USA is, the organization that I work uh, with, and why our religiously founded anti-poverty coalition would become involved uh, in this particular legal case a few years ago, a legal case which is considered to be, uh, up until recently, a rather obscure legal case. Uh, a case between a country that caucuses with the G20 uh, and uh, is is litigating a group of hedge funds. Um, why would Jubilee USA, that's founded by groups like American Jewish World Service, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, most of the Big Ten mainline national churches, unions, and others, why would we ultimately file with the U.S. Supreme Court uh, urging the Supreme Court uh, to take this particular case. So, you know, for Jubilee USA, uh, our involvement is defined by our history and our mission. Um, first, let's start with our mission. So our mission as Jubilee USA is to end extreme poverty and shift global inequality. Uh, around the world right now, 85 people own more wealth than 3.5 billion people. 85 people own more wealth than more than half of the world's population. The International Monetary Fund uh, notes that the root cause of inequality is global sovereign debt, the basis of our credit-based global financial system. Right now around the world, one out of five people live in extreme poverty. And for our organization, we believe that's one out of five people too many. We know that extreme poverty exists because of either a failure uh, of debt, tax, and trade policies, or the lack of such policies in the international financial system. Right now, for every $10 in aid uh, from from uh, developed countries uh, to the developing world, $50 is leaving in debt payments, and another $100 is leaving because of corruption and corporate tax avoidance. So for right now, for every $10 in aid that comes uh, from the northern world, from international financial institutions, um, developing countries are losing more than $150 in revenue uh, and these uh, countries continue to take out loans and rack up uh, what's unsustainable debt. Jubilee USA harnesses the voice of our national member organizations and 400 faith communities around the United States to change the policies that keep people poor. Our mission compels us to look at how the legal precedent in this particular case that we're talking about today will hurt some of the poorest economies in the world. Our organization continues to move the G20, the United Nations, uh, the U.S. government, the International Monetary Fund, to change these policies. In fact, uh, as uh, Matthias noted in this past week, uh, we won uh, more than $100 million <coughs> spends more money on debt than on public health, and these monies that we've won will now become long-term investments in health care infrastructure uh, in these countries. These continuous gains from our mission lead us to describing our history as Jubilee USA. Uh, Jubilee USA's history counts over $130 billion in debt relief for the world's poorest countries. By international laws that we've won, proceeds proceeds from uh, these policies um, essentially benefit the world's poorest people. Um, these proceeds build social infrastructure in developing countries. These policies that we've won include the Heavily Indebted Poor Countries Initiative, or HIPIC, and the Multilateral Debt Relief Initiative, uh, the MDRI. Um, the last initiative, the MDRI, was implemented by President George W. Bush. 
And uh, along uh, with his funding to deal with the global AIDS crisis, global debt relief is seen as one of the two most positive accomplishments of the George Bush legacy. Currently, Congressional Quarterly cites the efforts of Jubilee USA as the last bipartisan efforts on Capitol Hill. Because our organizing moves Republicans and Democrats to work together, these bipartisan policies have created more accountability and transparency in the financial system and more protections for poor countries. Much of this historical debt relief that we won has its roots in corruption and propping up some of the world's most terrible dictators. So a lot of the debt relief that we're winning uh, is money that was used to uh, prop up uh, regimes that were taking money from their people and were corrupt regimes. So right now on the one-year anniversary of Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, uh, a lot of people are looking at the debt uh, in, in the country of the Philippines. And that's just a very clear example that that debt is rooted um, uh, more than $10 billion of corruption, according to the World Bank. Uh, from uh, the corrupt Ferdinand uh, Marcos regime and that particular dictatorship. And still today, that country is dealing with the debt that came from that dictatorship. So uh, as Jubilee USA, we've won billions in debt relief and social investment for the countries that need it most. And because of this history, um, you know, we were devastated to see that groups known as vulture funds, the so-called vulture funds, were targeting and actually collecting the aid monies we were winning for the poorest countries in the world. In 2008, a vulture fund known as Donegal and Associates collected millions in debt relief money um, from uh, Zambia, uh, which Zambia had won that debt relief money to build schools and send kids to school. They were targeting, uh, they were targeting and collecting the very monies uh, that we were winning to help the poorest people in the world. So <clears throat> Zambia, um, which was supposed to have millions of dollars to build schools and send kids to school, uh, a group of vulture funds collected that money and through the court system targeted and collected that money. So it never went to build schools. Uh, it was collected by these particular vulture funds. As an aside, uh, it should be noted that these kinds of predatory hedge funds that are collecting debt relief monies that are funded by U.S. taxpayer dollars, um, these same funds also refuse to pay U.S. taxes because they are domiciled in tax havens uh, in order to avoid U.S. taxes. So Jubilee USA was compelled to be involved in this case uh, because these so-called vulture funds were targeting the aid monies we were winning for the world's poorest countries. Uh, they targeted our very history of accomplishments. Because of our mission, we are a coalition of groups who reform global policy to protect the poor and end extreme poverty. The decision in this case sets a precedent that exploits poor countries and makes it much more difficult for poor countries to restructure their debts or prevent default. So this brings us to the question, you know, what is a vulture fund or, or a predatory hedge fund? And what happened to Argentina and why and how does this case matter? Uh, a vulture fund is a type of hedge fund that buys debt for pennies on the dollar um, or um, buys debt for pennies on the dollar uh, of a poor country or an economy in financial distress, as in the case of Argentina after its 2001 default. Uh, the hedge fund then uses the laws of the financial jurisdiction where the debt contracts were signed in order to collect full payment. So in other words, in the case of Argentina, their debt, their bonds, were signed under contract law in the state of New York, one of the major financial jurisdictions of the entire world. So when there's a problem with Argentina's debt, the dispute is settled uh, in the New York court system. Um, the hedge fund, uh, as I noted, then uses the laws of the financial jurisdiction where the contracts are signed 
uh, in order to litigate for full payment. These types of funds often make an upward of a 1,400% profit. The business practice originally developed from these funds buying up distressed companies and then selling off pieces for profits, and the name originally comes from these companies naming the their own business practice as scavengers. However, the current practice developed as a much more predatory practice, taking advantage of economies facing distress or poor countries um, that are struggling already to maintain their basic infrastructure. In Argentina's case, after their 2001 default, they restructured their debt and settled with more than 92% of the groups and individuals who held Argentine debt through a series of deals in 2005 and 2010. Two vulture funds who had bought the debt cheaply uh, became holdouts and refused to participate in the debt restructuring of the other 92%. Instead, these funds litigated Argentina for full payment in New York courts because the contracts were signed under New York law. These predatory hedge funds refused to take these deals and subsequent deals. If these predatory funds had taken the original deals that 92% of all bondholders had taken, they would have made a profit of 157%. But these funds seek to make a profit of more than 1,200% and set a global precedent in the New York financial jurisdiction that forces the poorest countries in the world into submission or prevents them from restructuring their debts. Essentially, according to the International Monetary Fund, debt is the root cause of global inequality. And this is where the case has a global impact, and this is where we enter as Jubilee USA. Much of the world's sovereign debt is contracted in the world's chief financial jurisdiction, New York State. Any court jurisdiction within this system sets a powerful precedent in favor of the hedge funds and against the world's poorest countries. Only a country with the resources of Argentina or G20 country would have the wherewithal to spend an estimated $400 million litigating this case over the last decade. Countries like Grenada or the Democratic Republic of Congo don't have these resources, let alone that budget. And now vulture funds have a powerful new precedent in their toolbox that will make it even more difficult for poor countries to oppose their will. Part of the problem in this case is that the ruling out of New York interprets a parity or pari passu clause in favor of the predators and against how every country, every global financial institution, and every major group of investors interprets the clause. Because Argentina is paying more than 92% of its bondholders at a restructured rate, the New York court interpret this to mean that the predatory funds and the holdouts should also be paid. But instead of them being paid at the same restructured rate as most of the world believes Argentina should pay, the court decided that these predatory funds and these holdout funds should be paid in full. The U.S. Second Circuit Court ruling hurts poor economies and essentially ruled that there is no risk in extremely speculative behavior. As a result, these types of funds are quickly buying up debt across Eastern Europe, Africa, Latin America, Asia, and in the poorest countries of the world. The precedent that this particular court case sets also encourages all investors to hold out during any country debt restructuring um, and refuse to be part of a restructuring until they're paid in full. After the Second Circuit Court ruling was made, the final appeal on this case was set in motion uh, And because of our history, when we filed with the Supreme Court this past spring, we opened our filing by noting, using law to dispossess the poor for the pleasure of the powerful offends not only the sense of justice embodied in United States policy, <clears throat> in United States policy <clears throat> but it offends the even more ancient principles of biblical justice 
revealed in the scriptures of our faiths. <clears throat> we went on to note in our Supreme Court uh, filing that the opinion um, of the Second Circuit Court now threatens to unravel United States debt relief policy and undo much of the progress made on behalf of the poor. And we continue to argue that allowing the decision below to stand would equip financial companies that prey on the poorest nations and people of the world with a game-changing legal precedent to accelerate their predation. So essentially, the precedent encourages all investor, investors to hold out during any debt restructuring. After the Second Circuit Court ruling was made, um, the final appeal of this case went to the Supreme Court and against our ruling, against the ruling of big banks, of investors, uh, of uh, other organizations and individuals like economist Joseph Stiglitz, uh, the Supreme Court decided not to take the case and upheld the U.S. Second Circuit Court ruling. And essentially when they did that, um, during this legal battle, the U.S. government, the majority of investor groups, the International Monetary Fund, all weighed in our, in, on our side because of the major repercussions of this case. In spite of the global consensus, the Supreme Court refused to hear the case, and while hearing a related case, they ultimately upheld the lower court's ruling. So what does this court precedent mean for poor countries beyond Argentina? Uh, in terms of our research and other cases that are standing right now in the New York jurisdiction, Jubilee USA has found that there are two immediate cases um, where very poor countries can be hurt by this precedent. One is the Caribbean island of Grenada, uh, where 40% of the population lives in poverty. Uh, and on the island of Grenada, uh, right now, um, they're going through a debt restructuring and a copycat case using the same parity clause uh, is being used by a holdout to collect in full from Grenada while they're restructuring all of their other debts. The second case that we've seen that could be impacted uh, is with the Democratic Republic of Congo, the DRC. Uh, according to the United Nations, the DRC uh, is the second least developed country in the world. Uh, and recently, in the New York court system, they lost a case against two vulture funds um, for $68 million, $50 million in interest uh, from vulture funds known as Themis and Des Moines Capital. And these particular vulture funds um, that, have co that, that have now won an award that includes $50 million in interest, um, they right now, in order to collect that money, will come up against the same kind of parity clause. So this precedent in the Argentina case, we see uh, having an impact on some of the world's poorest economies. At this point, the United Nations, world governments, investor associations, and the International Monetary Fund agree that predatory and holdout behavior must be stopped. These groups have suggested um, and build consensus around the three uh, around the following three possible solutions to stopping predatory behavior. One, um, the first solution, which we support, we support all three solutions at Jubilee USA, is making changes to contracts um, so that future contracts between governments and between um, investors would ultimately argue that. Um, the parity clause should be defined as we believe it should be defined, that if a country has to restructure its debt, that all investors, all bondholders, whether they bought the debt in the secondary market, as vulture funds have, uh, that they have to agree to a settlement uh, that the majority of bondholders agree to. So right now in the financial system, that, that doesn't exist. And so we actively support that particular solution. Um, and one of the largest investor and bank uh, groups around the world, the International Capital Markets Association, also supports uh, that solution because they believe it's good for business and good for investors. I think it's important to note that this particular case, um, that we have not only groups like ourselves um, very concerned by this behavior, um, but also investors and banks 
um, uh, legitimate investors in banks are also uh, very concerned by this behavior because it hurts them. The International Monetary Fund has also endorsed this, and the International Monetary Fund has even gone as far to endorse the second solution, which is changes in laws, statutory solutions. Um, and so that means changing laws that govern the financial jurisdictions in the United States, as well as financial jurisdictions around the world, that outlaws this particular type of predatory behavior. And the third and most comprehensive solution, which has moved forward because of the crisis uh, that has been revealed by this case, is the implementation of an international bankruptcy process, which we also very much support. And I believe my colleague uh, Juan Pablo will discuss this in more depth. But essentially, when we look at, a, uh, at an international bankruptcy process, we saw a vote come to the United Nations this past August uh, where almost all of the countries in the world voted in favor of an international bankruptcy process at the United Nations General Assembly. Only 11 countries voted against that process, and these 11 countries include financial jurisdictions um, that would not like to see this process move forward. But I think it's really important to know what this international bankruptcy process and this vote represents is, is not only a vote against this predatory extreme behavior, but we have to understand that most of the world is in favor of an entire shifting and changing of how the international financial system operates. It's incredibly significant because countries around the world not only want to see predatory behavior be stopped, but they want to see defaults and debt restructuring stopped. They want to see defaults limited, they want to see debt restructuring change as we know it, they want to see our entire global financial system become much more stable than it currently is. So in other words, when Argentina defaulted in 2001, if such an international bankruptcy process had existed, Argentina never would have defaulted, and predatory hedge funds would have been forced to sit at the table to negotiate from day one. So we have to understand, outside the United States, there is... Uh, an amazing movement right now to actually change how the financial system operates. Um, it, it's really uh, significant uh, when we understand that most of the world looks through a lens where they see right now the current financial regime is not working for most of us and that right now we need to implement some kind of system for change. Um, also, the International Monetary Fund has set forth uh, a series of three papers that also advocate um, portions or aspects of an international bankruptcy process to prevent predatory behavior, but again, also limit defaults and prevent the current global regime of debt restructuring uh, as we know it. So, you know, right now what we know is that there's strong global consensus not only against the predatory behavior, but also um, to be able to change how the financial system operates. Um, so for our work at Jubilee USA, um, you know, we support these three particular solutions that are endorsed um, at different capacities by global decision makers around the world, and we believe that in order to end poverty, in order to shift and challenge inequality, we can only be successful if we start to implement these very specific and very real solutions that are on the table. Thank you. So thank, thank you, you very much, much, Eric. And now we're going to Argentina, Argentina to talk with Juan Pablo Pokoblaski, who is a United Nations independent expert on the ethics of foreign debt on human rights. Juan Pablo? Yeah, can, can you hear me? At least from this side, the, the quality of the connection is not very high. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, in this panel with Eric and Gaston, two directors of the two very, I would say, leading NGOs on economic and social rights and the issues which, by the way, 
supported me during the campaign uh, in the Human Rights Council. So I'm very thankful to both of them, and I want to say it publicly. Uh, thank you very much, Matias, and the Latin American Center of the University of Arizona and Asuntos del, del Sur for organizing this panel to discuss this amazingly complex issue of the links between uh, debt and human rights. Uh, so as you probably noticed, I'm already challenging the title of this panel, because if you have a look at the figures, contemporary figures of debt, I would say that more importantly, um, more important than foreign debt currently is uh, domestic debt. But this is an issue that we can uh, discuss further if we have this chance. Uh, so I got an appointment uh, in the Human Rights Council in June. I'm a UN uh, expert on foreign debt uh, and human rights. Uh, my, I, I don't know how familiar uh, you are. This is something that Matthias, we, we haven't talked about it, about the audience there. I, I see young faces, so I assume that most of you guys are students, uh, some professors. Uh, so, but just in case, let me very briefly tell you a little, a little bit about the special procedures system of the Human Rights Council. The Human Rights Council appoints experts to deal with particular problems or with particular countries uh, dealing with uh, human rights issues. Um, I'm working, uh, or my task, my mandate is basically doing analytical work on debt and human rights and also denounce situations in which human rights are compromised. Um, and let me start my presentation by uh, saying that foreign debt or sovereign debt more broadly and human rights poses challenges which are much broader than bull to found litigation. Uh, a, a month ago I presented in the General Assembly my work plan for the next years, I mean the thematic priorities. Uh, so let me present or explain them very briefly. So uh, it's going to help me to, to make the point that uh, when we talk about debt and human rights, we are talk talking about, of course, Bluetooth foundation litigation, but we are talking about many other things. So the, uh, the, the first area that I want to explore is to what extent debt policies and debt management strategy designed and implemented by governments are using international human rights law in order to avoid or prevent debt crisis. I mean, in the international discourse, international human rights law plays no role at all when we talk about how governments administrate or uh, are managing their debts. So we usually don't see any reference to human rights when we see how governments are dealing with these portfolios. If, if, you, had the, if you have a look at the manuals of the World Bank or the IMF, there is no reference to human rights obligations about how governments should manage the debt portfolio. So this is an issue that I want to explore. To what extent human rights law can contribute to a better management of sovereign debt. Another issue is, of course, uh, human rights in the context of debt restructuring and debt relief. Eric already presented uh, the human rights implications and externalities of aggressive bull to found litigation. I have the impression that there is an emerging legal framework 
uh, at the international level on uh, bankruptcy law applied to countries. And one of the one of the signs of this progression is um, human rights. And human rights can have a very concrete and operational implication in the context of debt restructuring, in terms of standstill, in terms of uh, seniority, in terms of how we distribute financial losses between creditors and debtors, but also among different kind of creditors. Uh, uh, of course, they can make a difference in the process and in the outcome of whole out uh, creditor litigation. Uh, as you know, and Eric already said a few words about it, there is a process that has been triggered in the General Assembly. Countries are negotiating a legal framework on the restructuring. Um, in, at the same time, there is a parallel process in Geneva in the Human Rights Council. The Council passed a resolution a month or two months ago uh, elaborating on the Bulto Found litigation in New York and requesting a, a report in, in this area, which I think can contribute to the debate in, uh, in New York. Uh, you, you, you know, uh, also already Eric presented the, uh, the most important proposals uh, in this area. Uh, I mean, basically a market approach or collective action clauses and a more statutory approach. Um, so the statutory approach, I guess, is more open to discuss the possibility of using human rights law as applicable law in that uh, restructuring. Uh, even though when we talk about collective action clauses, even ag with aggregated or improved collective action clauses, human rights law can play crucial ro a, a crucial role. Let me give you an example. I imagine a world which is ruled by nice, beautiful, aggregated collective action clauses, which says that if you get 75%, 80%, or 90% of the creditors, you will get an agreement which cannot be challenged by dissident creditors. But the question that has not been answered so far under this contractual model is what will happen if this magical number is not reached. I mean, what will happen if it's very clear that you need 75% to uh, consolidate the agreement? What happens if you don't get it? I have the impression that this is not a, a theoretical question only, but a very practical one. Because the same question that we are raising today will show up. To what extent human rights law can protect the population of debt of countries that cannot get an agreement with the creditors. So another uh, another issue that I want uh, to explore during the, the coming years is uh, good practices in dealing with debt crisis. Uh, there are some uh, situations, um, a lawyer would say, a state of necessity in which governments have to apply some retrogressive measures. So um, my point is that in every debt crisis, there will be some human suffering. My point here is some governments have tried to minimize this human suffering by designing and implementing measures in order to minimize the human uh, externalities and some other governments have actually exacerbated the human damage. Um, as far as I know, there is no set of best practices 
um, which can help government to take the uh, the best decisions. In two weeks, I'm going to Iceland, I'm going um, on country mission. Going to be my first mission because I have the impression that um, we can uh, learn some lessons about what happened in Iceland, and particularly in terms of how the participation of the population of the dead so can make a difference in the process and in the outcome of that restructuring. The, the fourth area I want to explore is debt disputes and bilateral investment treaties, or BITs. Um, you probably know that creditors, particularly Holland creditors, are using the exit convention or international investment arbitration to challenge debt agreements. Uh, so this this is posing fundamental questions about how we balance uh, create the property rights, state's responsibility, and the fundamental rights of debtors population. Um, and here again, I have the impression that human rights law can help arbitrators to make sure that they they find and the rule balanced decisions. Uh, this is not a theoretical or a mere intellectual exercise. Argentina and Greece have been challenged under the umbrella of BITs for the debt agreements. Um, and another important, I think, issue here to be considered is whether the current international arbitration system is institutionally and politically able to deal with the collective action problems that every debt restructuring poses on the table. Um, the fifth area I want to explore, and it's going to be uh, my next report to the Council, is uh, financial complicity. To what extent lending to authoritarian regimes uh, means consolidating their political position with all the human suffering that this entails. So I, here I'm planning to, I'm doing an um, analytical, uh, quantitative and qualitative studies to see whether in reality the more funds you give to an authoritarian regime, the longer the life of the authoritarian regime. This is a presumption that Prima facie, I have confirmed with the figures that I, I got, and these can have some legal implications, I suspect. And the final uh, issue I want to explore is illicit financial flows. The Human Rights Council passed a separate resolution last year requesting the mandate holder to uh, study the roots and causes of capital, illicit capital inflows and illicit uh, capital outflows. So here the, uh, the, the issue is not limited to the repatri repatriation of stolen assets, but much broader, including um, uh, price transferring and, and tax evasion uh, especially. Uh, so I, I better stop here so I leave some time to Gaston and hopefully to some discussion with uh, the people there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you very much. Uh, Juan Pablo, now it's turn to for Gaston Chilier, Executive Director of CELS. Gaston. Thank you, uh, Matias, very much, and thank you, Asuntos del Sur and uh, Center for Latin, Latin American Hi, Center. Mike. Are you hearing me? 
Yes? Okay. Keep, keep talking. The, the Latin American Center of the University of Arizona for inviting me to participate in this very interesting meeting and a, a meeting that is very important for Argentina, but not only for Argentina, but uh, for many, many other countries uh, in the world. I wouldn't say only develop, uh, undeveloped countries, but also developed countries in the world. Um, as uh, you know, uh, just I will make a disclaimer. I am not an expert on on sovereign debt and financial markets, uh, but uh, CELS, the the organization, the human rights organization that uh, I represent, has been working on human rights issues since 1979 and was created during the dictatorship and since the 90s we are uh, working. Uh, heavily on the protection on economic and social rights. Um, and actually, from that perspective, uh, we address the issue of the crisis, uh, the conflict between Argentina, the vulture funds, and the ruling from the judicial uh, branch of the United States, uh, because uh, we consider that um, that conflict has posed a global, a global problem uh, uh, with an impact on human rights. So, before the, the I mean, the, the, before the, the General Assembly, the resolution that was adopted on September, uh, the last September 9th, uh, we, at CELS, we have elaborated a statement with other organizations, international organizations and, uh, and national organizations, among them the Center for Economic and Social Rights and the Center of Concern, uh, that uh, was uh, signed by more than 100 organizations over the world, and, um, and I think those are uh, many of the actors that are part of the movement that uh, Eric uh, Lecom uh, mentioned before that actually are standing up against these kind of practices of the vulture funds. Uh, and I take the opportunity to say also actually I I, I uh, didn't say that it was it's, it's a pleasure to, to share the panel with uh, Eric and uh, Juan Pablo as well. So uh, this uh, a statement that we submitted to the General Assembly first and then to the uh, Human Rights Council uh, that uh, uh, basically uh, in both resolutions uh, deal with the issue of human rights and restructuration of debt. Uh, we address the issue of the uh, foreign debt from an international human rights law perspective. So, I will basically uh, will read the most uh, important point of those statements since uh, they are still very uh, uh, active in this discussion. Uh, so as Eric mentioned in a recent decision, the U.S. Supreme Court denied cert on a petition filed by the Republic of Argentina in the case initiated by the Virtual Funds NML that had acquired Argentine sovereign debt bonds after 2002 default and had not accepted the terms of the agreement reached with over 92% of the bondholders in 2005 and 2010. Thus, the Supreme Court affirmed a lower court opinion that interprets the standard pari passu clause, as uh, Eric explained very well, that it means equal uh, rank and treatment as forbidding Argentina from making payment on its restructured debt if at the same time it doesn't pay the bondholders who didn't accept the terms of the agreement and aim to achieve a 1,600% return on the original investment. This interpretation diverges from the meaning that has been given to these clauses for decades and endangers the, agree the agreements states reach with creditors in debt restructurating negotiations. In 2010, there were already more than 50 claims 
of these sorts against highly indebted countries, and many of them are still pending. As a result, this, the conflict between Argentine, the vulture funds, and the judicial branch of the United States must not be understood as an isolated case. It's not an exception, but rather, rather as the expression of a global problem that impacts the effective implementation of human rights. This is a case about the conflict between the, a few bondholders who rely on predatory practices furnished by the financial system and the ability of states to reach agreements with the majority of their sovereign debt holders and guarantee the economic, social, and cultural rights of their people. Today, this tension is at the center of one of the most heated debates in the international community about how to balance the interests of creditors and debtors in a way that ensure states can respect their obligations in the promotion and protection of rights. The Article 1 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights establishes that quotation, all people may of their own ends freely dispose of their natural wealth and resources without prejudice to any objections arising out of international economic cooperation based upon the principle of mutual benefits and international law. In no case may a people be deprived of its own means of substance, end of cooperation. Since the, since the early 90s, one of the main concerns of the Committee on Social, Economic and Cultural Rights, the body in charge of monitoring the implementation of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, has been the adverse impact of the debt burden on the relevant adjustment measures on the enjoyment of economic, social and cultural rights in many countries. This issue has been on the committee's agenda in its periodic evaluation of a state party and its observations about the extent and content of the right enshrined in the covenant, particularly in the realm of education, nutrition, employment, social security, and cultural rights. In 2012, the United Nations Human Rights Council endorsed the guiding principles on sovereign debt and human rights. And its principle six established that states should ensure that any and all of their activities concerning their decisions on lending and borrowing, the negotiation and implementation of loans agreement or other debt instruments, the utilization of loan funds, debt payments, and the negotiation and restructuring of external debt don't derogate their human rights obligations. In addition, the Principle 8 established that any foreign debt strategy must be designed not to hamper the improvement of conditions guaranteeing the, the enjoyment of human rights and must be directed inter alia to ensuring the debtor state achieve an adequate level of growth to meet their social and economic needs and their development requirements, as well as fulfillment of the human rights obligations. In November 2013, Cepas Lumina, the, former, the predecessor special rapporteur on independent expert on the effects of forest debt, the predecessor of Pablo Bohoflaski, following a fact-finding visit to Argentina, supported and open a quotation, the position of the government not to yield to unreasonable demands by some vulture funds that continue to litigate against the country in foreign jurisdictions, and urged all countries to enact legislations as a matter of priority to limit the ability of unscrupulous investors to pursue immoral profits at the expense of the poor and most vulnerable through pro protected, uh, protected litigation. At the same time, Lumina recalled that the principle emphasized this, that the state should ensure that the rights and obligations arising under an agreement or deal 
on external debt are not inconsistent with their obligation to meet the minimum basic level of each economic, social and cultural right and don't lead to the deliberate adoption of regressive measures. So these international human rights norms which precede the US judiciary decisions about vulture funds are not the only ones that have been ignored. By redefining the meaning of paripasu clause, the new decisions opens up a scenario that increased the incentive of for sovereign debt holders to refuse to negotiate in future crises, which will hamper or make the implementation of debt restructuring processes for countries in need close to impossible. International public, public law also establishes principles for conflict resolution mechanisms that favor consensus building to restrict abusive practices. In 2012, the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development unveiled the principle of promoting responsible sovereign lending and borrowing, which don't create new law, but rather are based on public or general principle and jurisprudence that are present in existing national and international laws on the matter. Principle 15 highlights that if a restructuring of sovereign debt obligation become unavoidable, it should be undertaken promptly, efficiently, and fairly. Principle of, uh, principles of good faith and non-abuse use of the law are part of general principle of the law recognized by civil, civilized nations, according to the Article 38 of Rule of the International Court of Justice and are reflected in rules and practices regarding debt restructuring widely endorsed by the state legal framework. They become relevant in light of gaps left by treaty and customer international law and do serve as norms to guide the behavior of states, including that of the judicial bodies. The practices of those who acquire bonds of countries in crisis with the sole intent of obtaining preferential treatment through abusive measures are not consistent with the principle of good faith. So the decision of the US judiciary evinces the arbitrary and inconsistent nature of the court's interpretation of contractual clauses and has a result of hampering the state's ability to fulfill the basic human rights obligations. So, the actions of vulture funds represent one of many expressions of the injustice inherent in the global financial system. Thus, the measures taken to fight them must become a necessary part of the current system of reform agenda, which requires urgent collective actions, as um, uh, Eric has mentioned before. These actions should be taken in order to A achieve that all states and particularly the United States and other jurisdictions where similar claims have been filled enact laws and restrict the predatory activities of creditor, creditor funds. B. Ensure that debt states implement procedural safeguards that limit foreign jurisdictions' ability to impact the full enjoyment of human rights and C, create an international mechanism that is neutral and independent designed to resolve disputes concerning the restructuring, the restructuring of sovereign debt based on the obligation of a state to respect, protect and enforce human rights both in their territories and extraterritorially. Such a multilateral and contemplate an immediate state of all payment as of the initiation of proceeding, this mechanism should also make a determination about what constitutes a sustainable debt burden, taking into account the need to recover economic viability and ensure the population's human rights are met and on the basis decide that level of restructuring is necessary. Such a mechanism should recognize that a sovereign deb debtor is different from a private debtor and provide opportunities for participation, accountability, and transparency that encompass the debtor country population. The, the elaboration of a new set of sustainable development goals and 
of a renewed framework for commitment for international cooperation in the finance development provide an opportunity to promote the creation of such mechanisms and other measures to resolve a sustainable debt scenario in line with human rights principles. So to finish, uh, after uh, the General Assembly adopted the resolution 68-304, uh, this special mechanism was one of the recommendations or one of the mandate of the General Assembly. So I think uh, for the movement around the world, um, and actually as has been said by Juan Pablo and, and by Eric, the, the impact on, on the human rights related with the sovereign debt is, uh, is, is very clear. Uh, and, it's, uh, and I think when we talk about human rights for the students that are there, when we talk about human rights protections at the global level or the regional level, there is always a mechanism, an independent mechanism, in order to monitor human rights. And I think the task for us, in some way, is to promote a global discussions and to mobilize around in order to create that such mechanism and avoid that any national jurisdictions, uh, either from the United States or from another country, could uh, open opportunity for this kind of predatory practices like the vulture fund because at the end of the day the decision made by a judge in New York uh, it can and it may affect and probably will affect the life of millions of people either in Argentina and DRC or in another country in the world and this is that goes uh, against the equal principle of the international human rights law and a principle of fairness and justice. Thank you. Now, 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 how do we deal with this? Are we fine? Do you have your audio on? What? Look at this. Do you have a full screen? Okay. Are we on? The, okay, we're fine. So, very interesting presentation we had, and and I see th this is online, and people have less patience with online conferences. I'm gonna have a couple of questions only, and I'm gonna start with one by myself. I want to ask you uh, to any of you. Uh, how do you read the declaration of the G20 this week that saying that they have to pay attention to this, especially when when the the most important leaders of the G20 are against any uh, advancement of a legal or multilateral uh, solution for uh, foreign debts? Eric? Are you? I should start. Yeah, take the ballot. Okay. Well, thank you. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I once again just want to uh, uh, thank uh, Matias uh, as well as Nicholas del Sur and uh, the Latin American Center for having myself and, and the other experts here. Um, you know, I mean, it's hard to understand. I, I know what we're talking about can feel pretty complicated. Um, but like we're really talking about like one of the most important <coughs> issues that's going to impact our lives. Uh, you know, the Financial Times, um, you know, discusses this case as the debt trial of the century, uh, and essentially the U.S. government has argued that this case um, and the way it was decided could actually impact the value of the U.S. dollar. Um, so I, I think we, we just need to understand that the implications from this case are significant. You know, my organization looks at the case from how it can impact poor people, but there's a real reason why big banks, big banks, and the investment community um, is involved. 
you know, so so now to uh, Matthias's question, you know, how do you read uh, what the G20 was uh, arguing in their release during their meetings? Um, but I think even specifically, um, the financial ministers of the G20 released a statement in September, and in their statement, they dedicated uh, an entire paragraph to this case, um, saying that they uh, believe that this particular case. Um, impacts uh, countries all around the world. They're very much against predatory behavior and that they believe by consensus the solution to this kind of predatory behavior uh, is by implementation of contract clauses. So, you know, part of what, what Matthias's question is suggesting, you know, is, is that enough? Uh, and even though the G20 is against this behavior, and is behind a unified solution. The reality of, of what they're arguing so far, uh, it's not enough. Uh, the reality is, is that um, although these contract changes are very important for future debts and how future debts are contracted, uh, and we believe that these contract clauses need to be implemented for future debts, it doesn't address uh, a problem uh, of over $900 billion in debt stock that's out there. So uh, over $900 billion in debt contracts that are signed in New York for decades won't be impacted by these contract clauses. So th that's why we very much support, and we believe that many G20 countries also support, actually changing the laws and financial jurisdictions to outlaw this behavior. So already major financial jurisdictions like the United uh, 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 Kingdom, um, Britain, uh, Belgium, the protectorates of the British Isles, the uh, Jersey Isle, as well as the Isle of Man, have all outlawed this behavior. We've seen laws that have passed throughout Europe that have also outlawed this behavior. So we're very much in favor of the same kind of law to pass in the United States to outlaw this behavior as well. Uh, and this type of law we've introduced in Congress before, um, and like all legislation that we introduce at Jubilee USA, it's jointly co-sponsored by Republicans and Democrats uh, because, it, you, you know, this isn't a single party issue. This is an issue that deals with core U.S. international policy. Um, so, so, you know, I think over the next two years we're going to see more financial jurisdictions like the United States and like Japan seek to pass laws that will outlaw the behavior. But in terms of the big question, um, which Matias raises, uh, as well as Juan Pablo um, uh, and Gaston also spoke about, uh, was what passed in the United Nations um, just a few months ago, which was a call for the implementation of an international bankruptcy process. And, and that's the major solution. I mean, contract solutions, Laws in financial jurisdictions are really important, but long term, in terms of being able to deal with this kind of behavior, we need to not only deal with the predators, but we need to limit default and we need to stop major financial crises from happening. So what we have to understand is, you know, many of us recognize the financial crisis that took place around the world and took place in the United States in 2008. What we're talking about in terms of what the United Nations passed, what the International Monetary Fund has been working on aspects of, is actually a solution to stop financial crisis, to stop countries from defaulting, uh, to be limiting defaulting and, and limiting uh, debt restructuring. So, you know, the question is right now is will the G20 support, you know, what is the most transformative solution? Uh, and although it's clear some G20 countries are on record for supporting the solution, all G20 countries support aspects of this particular solution. Um, in negotiations at the International Monetary Fund, we still don't have a global consensus from the world's most powerful countries that such a solution um, should move forward. Uh, and I think that's the real problem that we're dealing with, is that although we're going to have consensus on solutions to deal with just the predatory behavior, we actually need a solution um, to protect all of us from financial crisis. And that's what the United Nations is arguing needs to be implemented at this time. Maybe some... 
some of the Juan Pablo reasons, if you want to add something to that. Uh, go ahead. So, shall I go ahead? No. Can you hear me? No. no. Ah, no, I know why. No. Juan Pablo? Yes, can I go ahead? No? All right, we're going to Okay. So, I'm muting mic. Can, can you hear me now? My mic? Yes. 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 Can you can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay, I, I cannot hear you. Just say say, say, it word. say it word. Sorry, we're fine. Okay, perfect. Um, there's no much that I should say about the C20 process since I'm involved in the um, New York process. The C77 plus China requested my views. Uh, before the resolution, and I sent the formal letter to the C77, in which I basically said that uh, the countries prefer a market approach or contractual approach, whether they go for an international treaty or whether they go for a soft law set of principles, this is uh, really uh, a policy choice. Uh, but what countries must keep uh, in mind is that human rights law should be consi considered as applicable, technically as applicable law. And if they regulate uh, if and to what extent would to found or dissident creators can litigate against Debtors, countries should have an eye on what human rights or the limits imposed by uh, human rights law. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna. Okay. Thank you, Juan Pablo. We have uh, another question here. Uh, they can hear you, so it's pretty allowed to say who you are and okay. yes. um, My name is uh, Robert Alvarez. I'm a graduate student here at the University of Arizona for the Center of Latin American Studies and the uh, School of Government and Public Policy. I'm sorry, I, can, I can barely hear. Well, everybody can answer, but um, for Eric especially. Um, looking at the, the installation of some type of international bankruptcy body, obviously you guys are all looking at that and promoting that as the best solution that we have as of right now. Do you think that that's, that's actually politically viable? Uh, I'm this? sorry, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, the microphone is too far, I guess. Okay. Would you come? Come, walk. Say it here. I'm sorry. If you wanted to answer your question, you have to come. On the other side of the yeah, Come microphone. here. Or? No, use my microphone. Okay. All right. Okay. Which part did you do? Right. So from the beginning. Yeah. Okay. All right. So from the beginning, um, all three of you are advocating the institution of an international bankruptcy body in order to, or you're pushing this as the best solution for these this uh, these predatory loan practices. And uh, my question is. Do you think that this is something that's um, politically viable? Because any type of international body is going to need the support and, to a large extent, the power of the U.S. to kind of back up a lot of the uh, arbitration that would take place. Do you believe that uh, something like that is politically viable for the U.S.? Like I was saying, do you believe you have uh, bipartisan support? I and mean, do you believe that something like that potentially is even possible? 
Eric, you want to take? Sure. So, so I'll start off, um, and, th and that's a great question. And I think, um, you know, right now, what is politically possible in the U.S. and around the globe? You know, in the short term, um, it, it's the first two of the three solutions that I suggested when we were talking. And so, you know, there's global consensus and strong support from the U.S. government on the contract change. Um, I think that there is some support around the US, around the world, and I believe that there will be uh, additional support within the United States in the next two years for a statutory or law change that essentially prevents um, uh, the uh, the predatory behavior. Um, but it's uh, you know I, I think the the billion dollar question is. You know where is support for an international bankruptcy process in the near future? So you know I'd answer that you know in a few ways. So we have to understand that before this particular debate on an international bankruptcy process, there was a process that was fairly close to passing uh, in the early 2000s, which initially had the support of the U.S. government and was pushed strongly by the head of the International Monetary Fund. Um, and, and that was the Sovereign Debt Resolution Mechanism, the SDRM, that ultimately failed. But it was about implementing um, an international bankruptcy process. So that particular process did fail. Um, and, and I think over the past four years, um, you know, we weren't very... Uh, optimistic about such a, a proposal coming back again, but the reality of it is is that we've seen over the past 40 years, not only because of the Argentina case, but we have to understand even more importantly than what the Argentina case has revealed, um, the global financial crisis of 2008, um, and even more importantly, uh, what happened with Greece and the debt restructuring that Greece went through. Um, that there right now is much more momentum uh, around looking at a global bankruptcy process. You know, no one has a crystal ball. I mean, will such a process be implemented uh, in the next few years? I think it's doubtful that we would see the full implementation of a process in the next few years. With that said, uh, I, I very much believe that uh, because the majority of countries in the world and because a vote has passed so strongly in the United Nations, um, that a, a process will continue to be developed. I, I think that's true. You know, will that process of the buy-in of the United States, the UK, Japan, Australia, Germany, the countries where it matters most? Uh, in the short term, it won't in the United Nations. But I think where we will see aspects of the process, not the full process, but as, aspects of the process actually implemented or voted on in the next year, will be at the International Monetary Fund. So this spring when the International Monetary Fund meets, um, you know, a little birdie has told me there's going to be a very important vote. Um, and that vote is going to be looking at um, aspects of the process. So overall, is it politically viable? Um, I think it's certainly politically viable in our lifetimes. Um, is the process politically viable at the UN? You know, perhaps, well, are aspects of the process very likely going to move forward at the International Monetary Fund because of this global consensus? Yes. I mean, I, I think we will over the next year, two years, see aspects of the process move forward at the International Monetary Fund. So, Juan Pablo, do you want to react to that? Um, well, it's very... Clear. I mean, if you see the way the country have voted in the Human Rights Council and the Senate Assembly, it's very clear that an effective reform in financial relation, uh, the broader consensus is needed. This is this is very clear, and I guess this is the the greatest challenge for the Xi 77 plus China pushing. Uh, for this multilateral proposal. In any case, there is a previous discussion, which is whether the UN is the right forum to discuss financial issues, which is a very controversial uh, 
thing among um, state members. Uh, I do believe that this is the, I mean, the UN generally, the General Assembly and the Human Rights Council is the right forum to discuss this issue basically because, first, the equal membership of the UN, and, and second, because there is no conflict of interest. The UN is not a lender nor a borrower. Well, think that just I want Pablo's comment, and I know yeah. this is we're we're throwing a lot at everyone, but his comment's important about the neutrality of the United Nations. So the International Monetary Fund is a lender. You know, they are a creditor, right? And so any process they want to have housed within themselves, and that creates a bias. But what Juan Pablo is talking about, and also part of why this process passed at the United Nations, is because most of the world doesn't believe there's a bias at the UN. Even though the UN is a very dysfunctional system in many regards, it's an unbiased system, where the International Monetary Fund is a very biased system. And so that... You know, that contradiction, that point that Juan Pablo is noting is important. And, and although, you know, I'm talking about what is politically viable and what could happen, you know, I'm not making a value judgment on whether or not the IMF or the UN is a better place. At the end of the day, you know, I believe, and I believe my colleagues would believe, that such a process should be housed at the United Nations because it has... The, 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 it has the least uh, amount of bias in place, um, but there are also political, real, political realities about what could potentially move forward. Well, thank you very much to all of you. It's been a great conversation, a lot of information, and but we're going to finish here and maybe continue offline. Well, thank you to all of you. Have a nice afternoon. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you all. Bye-bye.